Hello, good evening, and welcome to Fact Sheet live on ETV Ghana. Here, if it is not the fact, we do not discuss it. And by now, I know that it's an open secret that Ghana is resorting to the IMF. And as we understand per information that we've gathered so far, the um, executives or officials from the International Monetary Fund are already in the country, and by tomorrow, they will start engagement. What really led us to go into the IMF? Previously, it had been a promise that we have what it takes to be on our own, to manage our own affairs. But unfortunately, what happened? That we are going back to the IMF. That is what we are going to discuss this evening. We are interrogating what precipitated our resorting to IMF and what we can do after IMF uh, give us whatever, it, whatever program that it would want to give us for us to stabilize things within our economy. What happens next? That is what we are going to discuss this evening. Let's go for a short break. When I return, I will introduce to you uh, my guest who help us interrogate this matter. Many thanks for staying on with us. This is Fact Sheet live on ETV Ghana. I am Sifat Dankwa. He's also live on Nisim in Tamil, Nisim in Bogatang, and also live on our social media platforms. Facebook, you can go there, and you can also click the share button and share to other individuals and groups uh, so that we all can do the conversation Tonight, tonight, I'm being joined by Dr. Adouwusu Sakodier, who is an economist and also a lecturer at University of Ghana, and also Mr. Julius Jima, who is a financial analyst and a tax expert. Professor John Gechi Gachi, who is the dean of the business school of University of Cape Coast, also joins us via Zoom. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My, my first question will be, We've gone to the IMF for 16 times. Doc, why our pension to resort to the IMF? All the 16 times that we've gone to the IMF, there was a need for the program. Need. The emphasis on the word need mm. for the program. Without the program, things would have been worse. Mm. This seven time, 17 times that we are going, there's still the need for us to go. The IMF program is not a long-term development program. Mm. The IMF program is a stability program. The IMF, uh, the IMF program is a balance of payment support program. So what they come to do is to come and give you stability. Mm -hmm. What you do with the stability is up to you. Because the program is usually for a period like one year, two years, maximum three years. The last time I went for the program, it was for three years. Mm -hmm. When we finished, they left the country. The IMF is not there to build your road for you. The IMF is not there to create jobs for you. The IMF is not there to reduce your poverty. The IMF is not there to do long-term development for you. Mm. They just give you stability. What you do with the stability is up to you as a country. So first of all, they give you some funds to, because we know in balance of payment, we have the current account side and the capital account yes. side. So when they give you, last time they gave us 918 million. Mm -hmm. That goes into the capital account to give us, to increase the international reserves and to give us some inflow or availability of dollars, let me put it in simple terms, of dollars, mm. so that the BOG can supply the dollars to whoever needs it. Mm. And with that supply of dollars, it stabilizes the CD. And because there's always a pass-through effect from the seed exchange rate to inflation and to interest rate, once the CD is stabilized, it tames inflation, it also tames interest rates. Mm. That's what we call the macroeconomic stability. Mm. So the IMF program gives you that stability from exchange rate to inflation to interest rate. And sometimes they also embark on what they call the fiscal consolidation part. The fiscal consolidation part, we mean bridging the gap between revenue and expenditure, which is a budget deficit, mm. and also slowing down borrowing, reducing the public debt. Mm. So they will encourage you to raise more revenue without necessarily overburdening uh, Ghanaians with more taxes. Maybe they will find device a strategy to increase revenue and, and or reduce expenditure. So anything they, they, they think is, is good, is prudent for government to narrow the gap between revenue and expenditure, they will do it. And so the, that macroeconomic stability plus fiscal consolidation mm -hmm. is what they will leave you with. And so we have the money, mm -hmm. then the stability, then the fiscal consolidation, and the, th the fourth one is the policy credibility, as people will say, because once a country is enrolled on the IMF program, 
our other investors, and even some of the multilaterals as to like World Bank and African Development Bank will be willing, they will have the confidence to work with you. And again, back to your question, I'm saying that when they finish, they leave. Mm. Whatever you do with the stability is up to you. So that is why in all the 16 time that we have gone, we had the stability, they left and we messed up again. Then we go the second one, mm -hmm. they give us stability, they leave, we mess, we mess up. Then the fourth one, then the fifth one, then the sixth one. 16 times they have given us stability, we have messed up as a country. It is not as if we don't know what to do. We know what to do. Mm. Most of the solutions are in our books. You take the man NDC manifesto is there. Take MPP manifesto is there. Take the budget statements is there. Take all the NDPC policy documents. They are there. Why are we not implementing them? Why are we not enforcing them? So that is why sometimes people think that IMF gives you conditionalities. Because they think that when they come into your country to have that program with you, mm. if they don't force you, let me use that word, quote unquote, force you to do some things, you will not do it. You will mess up again. So they will force you to do some things, to be prudent in your expenditure. Now, uh, the issue of cutting that expenditure may not be part of the conversation. Why? I don't want listeners to get me wrong. There's a difference between cutting down expenditure and being prudent or cutting down waste. Mm. Now, most of the expenditures in the budget are rigid. You can't cut it. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm coming. I'm coming. Compensation of employees. Are you going to reduce salaries of workers? No. Are you going to say you pay interest? That is where the problem is. Mm -hmm. Or that's where there's a small window. With the IMF program, we can renegotiate with our creditors mm. so that they can defer the payment of interest. interest. Payment. Yes. So that we can have some breathing space. Because if you take the first quarter of this year, mm -hmm. this year first quarter, mm -hmm. the tax revenue is 12.9 billion. The interest, the debt service is 13.9 billion. So the tax revenue alone is being consumed by the debt service. That's, that's the ratio is 108%. So the debt service, the interest payment plus amortization is very crucial for us to be able to do something about it. Now, when you come to the compensation of employees, you cannot reduce worker salary. Mm. What you can do there is to be prudent in some of the expenditures in goods and services like reducing the ghost names in the on the payroll like that just but these things sure we've, these things we've attempted doing before that's what i'm saying that but how come we've been there 16 times we do it they leave we mess up we do it they leave we mess up that has been the story julius let, let me let me quickly come to you before i go to professor gachi what in your assessment or what, in your view, is the issue? Good evening to our viewers. Good evening to Doc. I think, um, basically, um, Doc has just <laughs> said the English and then the jargons, but mm -hmm. the simple term is that government is broke. Um, if we look at um, from our 2021 budget coming to 2022 budget, mm. there wasn't enough fiscal space for government to spend. And like Doug said, the solutions are in our budget. They are in our manifestos, that is the political parties. But um, how do you then come into power and look at the revenue or the income available to government? Mm. Does it correspond to some of the programs and policies that you plan in your manifesto? first point before you are given the opportunity to come into government then you now look at the actual revenues you have as a state will it, will it help you to be able to execute that your plans and programs you know manifesto no so when that happens then automatically right away government has to look for other revenue measures so, so you mean that political parties when they are campaigning are over ambitious with Certainly, some of the projections yeah, certainly, and the promises yeah. that they give. Exactly. I mean, some of the programs are fantastic, but as a state, we do not have that money, that much money. We government ought to have maybe looked for. And one thing that, you know, sometimes we assess their manifestos, we assess the budget is that, you know, you look at the expenditures and the things are planned there, but they don't do you know, mo uh, uh, look at the revenue side and look at how they are going to generate the revenue to be able to match the expenditure. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you prepare a budget and your budget right away there is a deficit, how are you going to get the money to fund, you know, the other expenditures? Like Doc said, if you look at the budget carefully on the expenditure side, 
there is you know um, compensation that is payment of wages and salaries your interest payment and then if you look at grants to other government units these three items when you add them they exceed your overall revenue that you are looking at a doc was looking at the first quarter revenue against you know the, the debt servicing so right away the way we have you know fashion our budget I mean, I'm looking for a day that to prepare a budget and then we'll have a it's primary so surplus. <laughs> I'm looking for that day. <laughs> that means that we'll be having more revenue than our expenditure. And, you know, this is central government. If you look at government institutions as well, they are facing the same challenges that central government is facing. Mm -hmm. So in total, our country, you know, it, it, it's don't have that needed revenue to be able to turn around some of our programs and policies that government is looking for. So that is more reason why we are going to the IMF. There is no enough money. We are not generating enough revenue. And there is also that lack of, you know, fiscal discipline. And then we can talk about how government even spend those monies in achieving the programs and policies. And that is why perhaps, like Doc said, there's lack of that political will for government to even look at its own people and check them. Therefore, you would have to get somebody external to come in and then help you with your fiscal consolidation, how you are spending. But as, 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 as we've seen over the period, I mean, these checks that will be done by the International Monetary Fund isn't sustainable, isn't long lasting. Yes, you, you see, like, uh, um, they will come in to help you for short term. I mean, give you that liquidity access to be able to turn around your budget, some of your programs that you want to do. But the point is that, you see, uh, uh, um, you are sick, you go to the, the, um, the hospital, mm -hmm. you have been operated on, or maybe they perform surgery on you. Mm -hmm. Then once you are okay, you go back eating the same junk foods that you are eating. That is how we are running our current economy now. So the point is that, yes, the big brother is coming. It's coming to help you to put your house in order, make sure that you are financially disciplined, make sure you have value for money when you are doing purchases. That is consumption of goods and services. And it is also in the budget. And it's a very critical factor in a budget that we don't look at because government give contracts out to people, they supply goods and services to government and they pay them. It gives money back to the economy. Mm. But how do we do it? Are we giving the contract to the right people? What are their, are their prices competitive? These are the little, little loopholes that are in the system that usually we don't talk about. Yet, there is that way of siphoning money out of the system to, you know, individual. They enrich themselves, and yet government is still broke. And we come back to square one again. So the idea of going to the IMF, looking at the current economic crisis, these are some of the things that we are going back to the IMF. Let me, let me quickly go to Professor Gachi and, and, and ask, uh, Prof, uh, do, you, do you have a feeling that we have been that lazy in managing our economy over, over the years? Well, I think uh, it is not about laziness. It's about whether or not we've been able to manage the economy prudently. Uh, that is what has brought us to where we are. Uh, all the aspect of fiscal management, economic management have certain rules that you need to follow. Uh, the, the question is whether we have followed the rules over the years. Debt has a certain level that you should contain. Interest payment has a certain level that the economy can contain without any derailment. But where you are managing the economy in such a way that you are not mindful about these rules, it will lead you to where we are now. Even the support from the central bank, there is a limit to that in a, in a regulatory context. So if uh, you go beyond that, you weaken the central bank. So if the central bank is excessively supporting government in terms of providing funding, uh, we get to a situation which we call fiscal dominance. And that fiscal dominance weakens the strength of the central bank and uh, ensure that monetary policy tools that we are churning out will not become effective. So it's just a cycle. If you respect the rules, uh, you remain strong and robust. If you don't respect the rules, with time, it will catch up on you. That is what has happened to us. Even reporting of economic data, is another issue that has led us to this point. You recall that in 2019, the budget of government of Ghana 
uh, stated that we had positive uh, primary balance. We also uh, recorded 4.7 uh, deficits. But when government wanted to go to IMF for the 1 billion to cater for COVID expenses, you saw government reporting 7.5 deficit, negative uh, primary balance. So all these issues uh, create problem for proper economic management, and that has led to where we are today. Again, we have been told over and over that our in, uh, international reserve is so robust, 4 point something import cover, over $10 billion uh, reserve. But all of a sudden, uh, we are being told that we need to show up that reserve. That is why we have to go to IMF. So we are dealing with uh, credibility of data from economic management our attitude toward regulation towards economic management. That is what we are dealing with now for which we are bringing the IMF to support us. The IMF program this time around will help in, in the long term, not in the short term, because I know that obviously it is going to be as uh, Dr. Du Ousu uh, Sarkodie mentioned that it's going to be between one to three years. After one to three years, how do we sustain that stability? Well, that has been our problem. Uh, the IMF is coming to, uh, if you like, lay a new foundation of prudence, uh, lay a new foundation of proper uh, monetary policy management. The IMF is coming to bring us on board on how to ensure that we maintain lower inflation and uh, somehow stable exchange rate. Uh, we know the tools they use, but when they leave, we don't continue with such discipline, such prudence, such credibility. Uh, that is why we backslide and we go back to uh, what we have been doing that created the problem. So, the issue is about whether our leaders will continue uh, the, 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 the policy, the guidelines, the tools that are being used to reduce the instability to a stable situation. And that is why we lack the ability. And if our leaders would do that, uh, then indeed it's a, it's a long-term journey. But every long-term journey starts from a short term. So if we build up, then we will continue with the good result that we are expecting into the long term. But uh, if you look at uh, what we have done in the past with finance program, not because it is economically or financially prudent, but it is uh, a project that will actually draw people to us for the next election. Uh, so we need to look at that. And uh, one of our colleagues said that uh, there is no expectation that expenditure will be cut and something like that. Yes, some of the expenditure looks like mandatory and statutory. We may not see those things being touched, but efficiency of expenditure will be looked at for the financing of certain projects. If the efficiency that is expected, if the value that should be derived from such as some of these expenditures uh, are not in line with the rule, that will be local. So nobody will say because uh, NAPCO is very important uh, measure uh, to uh, ensure that uh, our young people are contained within a short period of time before uh, they look for uh, proper jobs and the rest. Uh, is something very good for, uh, for the country. Nobody will say free SHS is very good for the country. Therefore, if there is imprudent expenditure, inefficient expenditure uh, in, in, in implementing the free SHS, in implementing NAPCO, in implementing planting for food and jobs, et cetera, uh, we should leave it like that. No. So we should expect that everything will be scrutinized to ensure that expenditure requirements are met. Let me come back to the studio. 
Doc, the question is, how is it that we've been to the IMF for 16 times, and yet still we've not been able to gather the courage to tackle the very fundamental issues for which we consistently resort to the IMF? Well, well, first of all, let's not demonize the IMF as some people have sought to do. The IMF is uh, a world body organized to help countries that are in difficulties. And Ghana is a member of the IMF. Um, if not, you wouldn't have been able to withdraw the one billion dollar um, SDR. And so uh, the IMF is there because they know that countries would definitely have cyclical problems, mm. especially if it is an external shock. You know, we people have famine, war here and there, yeah. and which are likely to collapse economies. Mm. And so the IMF is set up. That is the mandate of the IMF. So I don't. Be, well, of course, I can mention political parties that have demonized the other party, mm -hmm. you know, bastardized the other party for yeah. going to the IMF. So yes. that's the political side I don't want to get uh, mm. the conversation into. When you meet the politicians, they can we, ask we can, them. We can, we can do that. But, but so the, the economic situation is that we should not demonize IMF. Mm. IMF is there to help countries. Ghana is a member of the IMF. Mm. If you don't want the IMF, then sign off. They don't want to be a member of the IMF. Okay? That's number one. So back to your question, why haven't we had the courage mm -hmm. to, you know, change the structure mm -hmm. and change things? Again, the, 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 the political will is not there. And I think Prof mentioned, my brother also mentioned that there's always the emphasis on votes than economics. Mm. So there is always the emphasis on votes yes. than economics. Yes. So... The, the, there's a trade-off or the, there's a dichotomy between economic efficiency and political expediency. The dichotomy. Between? Um, the, the economic efficiency and political expediency. expediency. Okay. For example, somebody has gone, I don't want to mention the, the town, some people have gone there to promise them <laughs> airports. <laughs> promise them airports. Before they come after me, I'll mention it. <laughs> But you know, you know that that town does not need airport. Perhaps what that town needs is a dual carriage road. Perhaps what that town needs is an efficient train system. But you have gone to promise them. So because of votes, you have to build the airport. Because mm. if you don't, you can't, go, votes yeah, there. you can't go there and campaign again. They will stone you. Mm. So that political expediency has always been at the forefront and relegated economic efficiency. Mm. And for example, ideologically, almost everybody thinks that free SHS is good. Ideologically, ideologically. Mm. The idea behind it is good, but the implementation should be efficient. The E-Levy idea is good. I have written a whole article on it. The E-Levy idea is good. Mm -hmm. That The fact that you want, to, you want those in the informal sector to pay some taxes to government mm. on their incomes. So you are going to use some kind of tax that you design so they can extract their in income tax. Good idea. How do we, did we implement it? There are so many things, and I'm not, I don't want people to do this policy, even during NDC time. Mm -hmm. There were so many projects, bus branding and all that, these guinea fowls, you know, traveling to Burkina Faso. We had all sorts of stories. T today I was having a class on economic development group mm. and, and asked my students to watch. <laughs> I hope they are watching. So we, we had learned a lot about solving the imbalance between mm -hmm. the rural development and urban development. Mm. Okay. The, the NDC manifesto, brilliant idea. MPP manifesto, brilliant idea. Mm. Even Liberia comes to Ghana to copy our news. So many comes to the beyond, Ghana Beyond Aid Agenda. That document has been replicated by Kenya and you know so many countries, Nigeria and all that. The ideas are so brilliant in, in, in the books. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the implementation, then we want to win the next election. And that is why prominent people in the country like former President Kofo and other people have spoken that if we want to have a long-term development 
plan and follow it. Mm. Then we have to change this four-year electionary cycle. Mm. Because you vote for the person, the first year is uh, appointment, yeah. transition period. Mm. Then the second and third year is for work. Then the final year is campaign. Mm -hmm. So out of the four years, it's only two, two years. effective years that the person works. So the IMF can give you the stability, give you the platform, whatever. But when they leave, I am in power. I am thinking about 2024. NDC is also thinking about 2024. So no matter what the IMF will leave us, because we want to win the next elections, the discipline is not there. When they come, they will tie your hands. Mm. When they come, they will tie. That's why most African economists wouldn't want an IMF program in an election year. Because <laughs> the IMF program will not allow you to be spending on unnecessary things yeah. to balloon the budget deficit. So the discipline, my brother, is not there at all. Mm. And I've already said that the IMF is not going to give you a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. They're not going to, they're not interested in employment. They're not interested in poverty. In fact, I read some of their documents uh, when people went for the IMF program, the structure adjustment program in the program, 80s. Yes. And they have cited examples from African countries and the Caribbean and mm. Asian countries. Yes. And the evidence is that all those that went to the Swatch Adjustment Program, mm -hmm. they came out with more poverty, came out with more unemployment because of more what inequality. they call their conditionalities. Yes. Over there, I had this argument with my professor in my PhD class. He was in favor, I was against, mm. you know, the Swatch Adjustment. I, I was of the view that it, has, it hasn't de deli delivered. And he said, it's actually delivered. And so we had this argument. And it was so, such a nice argument. So. The point is, IMF is not interested in the poverty level. They're not interested in your inequality. They're not interested in the flooding in Accra. Mm. They're not coming to tell you where to put, uh, uh, what is the housing project? Uh, Sagleme. Sagleme housing project. Yes. IMF is not coming to talk to you about uh, sugar factory, the commander sugar factory. IMF is not coming to dualize Accra, uh, you know, Kumasi Road. IMF is not coming to put your light on. IMF is not coming to let your tasks flow. Everything is up to you. And that's why most people believe that if we have the policies, why are we going to them? Why are we going to them? Now it is very critical. My brother has already mentioned that we are broke. <laughs> <laughs> and it's but, true. I, 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 we are broke. If we don't go to the IMF program, things will get worse. Ghanaians will go hungry. But we also know that the engagement, uh, I mean, it's not going to end just by tomorrow. Mm. Um, it's going to take a bit of a time. Mm. In the interim, what do we do? Let's say, for example, just supposing that uh, the engagement stretches for about additional six months. What do we do? Well, well, let me also say that because the whole world has recognized that we are not in normal times because of COVID and the war, mm -hmm. a lot of things are changing. Remember that Ghana has this Fiscal Responsibility Act, which you know, did not permit government to spend beyond 5% of the, the GDP, GDP. The budget yes. deficit, but they changed it. So, as the president has always said, we are not in normal times. So, I'm sure the IMF program now, because we, they believe that we are not in normal times, it shouldn't be like before. Maybe they will speed up. Because if we are a doctor and they are rushing a patient who has just had an accident, are you now coming to prolong the diagnosis and order the patient to die? And right now, many countries are signing on to the IMF program. I, I was just giving a list right now, about 24. Mm -hmm. 24 African countries are signed on to the IMF program. Some of them are just going for funding, others are going for the extended program. So, so IMF has already made its project or program available. So they are ready, prepared for Ghana. And I'm sure the government of Ghana also has some programs already in place. Mm. I was just reading the manifesto, MPP manifesto, and I saw the, the post-COVID program which is also similar to what they call the Ghana Cares or Batampa, or Batampa yes. project. So that program is just there already. It's anchored on industrialization, it's anchored on uh, fiscal uh, you know, consolidation, it's anchored on mm. stability, it's anchored on job creation and all that. So the IMF will just give you that platform for them to implement. So I'm sure they will speed up the, pro the process. They will mm. speed up. They may not delay at all. They will speed up the process. And why? I think the government will also want them to speed up the process. So maybe, perhaps, they will finish early. And then, and then put in place whatever they want to implement. Mm -hmm. 
for next year's election. Let, let me go to let me <laughs> go to next election. Next, next, <laughs> next, next, next election is, is, in, is in 2024. <laughs> yes, but if the program is for two years or three years, mm -hmm. of course they would want to finish the program Quickly. before. Yeah. Get maybe. out, get out yeah, bit maybe. before we enter. I said into, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> into 2024. Uh, let, let me go to the, uh, Zoom and also um, engage uh, Mr. Kofi Tinkrai, uh, who, Kranting rather, who is a 2024 independent uh, presidential hopeful and also a financial expert. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this, this evening. Mr. But Mr. Uh, first and foremost, you had predicted that obviously Dan Ghana will be going to the IMF. And I, I believe that this comes to you as no surprise at all. Absolutely not. Um, after 16 attempts, well, not attempts, but actually going to the IMF the 16th time, um, you, you would have to accept that and believe that uh, this is not an error. It's deliberate on the part of MPP and NDC because every time they've made this mistake, they have been bailed out by the IMF. They always know Uncle IMF will be waiting next door to bail them out. And it's because leadership has failed. Leadership has failed at an unprecedented level and Ghanaians, needs, we need to wake up to that and say, you know what, enough with NDC and PP. Uh, we need to usher in say, somebody who is me, concerned you say with the Ghana. The NPP and the NDC. Go ahead. Ghana went to the IMF uh, first in 1966. So would you still attribute whatever it is that we are facing, or the crisis, or the structural challenges that we are facing with the economy? Uh, will you attribute it to the NDC and the NPP? Absolutely. I mean, what what is leadership for? Not unless, of course, you don't understand what your responsibility is as a leader. But all these signs, listen, we're going to IMF today. When I say today, uh, now, it's not a surprise because the signs were evident five years ago. We were going to go IFM, uh, uh, IMF. You don't have any industries. What, what do you have to export? You don't have anything to export. Uh, over 3 million of your graduates are unemployed. You're spinning off about 300,000 graduates every year. You, what do you produce? You don't produce anything. You don't have any foreign exchange reserve. You are 84% debt to GDP. 128% of your uh, receivables go into debt payment, interest on debt payment, and public service workers' wages. So how can this be a surprise? unless of course you're not paying attention. Are you with me? And these governments, the governments of NDC and PP have not been paying attention because guess what? If it gets worse like it has, they know that uncle IMF will always come running to them to give them the money that they want. And they're not gonna learn from it. Who, who makes a mistake for once, twice, third time, 16 times? and I mean, who does that? It's deliberate. This is a Ponzi scheme. It's not IMF. It's not the NDC MPP sitting down to really have a serious conversation about how to move the country uh, to a position where they're not able to uh, take monies from anybody else or borrowing out of their noses. No, this is not a conversation they have in their parliament. They come to steal money, okay? And if, if you disagree with me, well, let them show us where all the money went. We got, we already got, uh, in 2019, we already got a billion dollars from uh, World Bank. Where is that money? Uh, nobody can account for it. We've, we've had record highs in cocoa and uh, gold market prices around the world has been incredibly high. Uh, 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 where is the money? Oil prices have been incredibly high. Where is the money? You can't account for that. So for you to go to IMF, it's a failure of leadership. These guys don't have the mental capacity to lead us anywhere. And I know uh, my, my, my astute uh, panelists are dancing around, try to be as diplomatic as possible because uh, they cannot really say how bad these guys are. But I will tell you that they're pretty bad. And nobody feels 16 times and gets an excuse. 
They're failures. <laughs> okay, and we need to get them off our grid so we can usher in somebody who's responsible, who's competent, uh, who's functional, with a science-based, data-driven, human-centered consciousness to leadership, knows what they're doing to take this steering wheel of Ghana. They haven't been responsible fiduciaries. It's just as simple as that. Mm. You could say it any way you want, but the truth is, they have not been responsible fiduciaries. So, so to and you, they should it's be fired. deliberate on the part of the two major political parties uh, in the country. But they also um, acknowledge that or they ag agree some way, somehow, uh, that for um, from 2015, when we went back to the IMF, it was as a result of some of the challenges, economic challenges that the country was going through. That was why we needed IMF uh, bail out. In 2022, we understand, you know, government officials consistently telling us that is as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and also the four or five months of Russia-Ukraine um, crisis that is affecting our economy. When you hear um, arguments of this sort, mm -hmm. how do you feel? I feel that, we, that our leadership is a failure. Because let me tell you, uh, COVID, bad as it was, countries made billions. If, see, when I'm a business person, Okay, aside from having a, a financial background, I'm a business person. When, 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 when you run into a crisis, it gives you an opportunity to exploit the crisis to make gains. It's only when you are not prepared that you get hit the wrong way, and then you have to figure out how you get up, brush yourself down, and keep going. So... If we had COVID and we did not make any money, we, we did not really activate our um, uh, 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 research hubs mm. to start on uh, uh, a vaccine, did we? We had to go around begging for vaccine all over the world, okay? Instead of us starting to, if, if we had um, uh, a research center where we could manufacture vaccines, we could have been the hub for the whole of Africa. Mm. That would have been an opportunity for us to make billions. But you see, the leadership doesn't think like that. The leadership thinks that everything comes and it's, it's, it's a disadvantage to us and we need to go and beg. This is not a proactive leadership. Okay. You see? Um, and, and the same thing with the, the Russian-Ukraine war. What, what you need to ask yourself is, how come we were not prepared? How come we were not prepared? You see, if we had a leadership that was prepared, we would not be in the dire situation that we're in now. It would not be an excuse. It would be an opportunity to make money. We would be the place where money is made in the West Africa, money is made for the whole of Africa. But now we sit and we beg because we have leaders who don't know how to think correctly. And it's, it's a thinking problem. You know, just because you've gone to school and you're a professor, you're a doctor, you're a parliamentarian, you're a minister, doesn't mean you're a functional thinker. We have a bunch of wrong thinkers in parliament who do not know how to think and take advantage of situations. And they have caused us to be, you know, paupers. So, so That's from, what your, it is. From, from your point of view, we've not been entirely that productive. I'll come back to you. Um, uh, Mr. Cranting, uh, let's go for a quick break. When we return, the question will be, I mean, after the steroids are given, uh, Doc is saying that, of course, we are going to return to square one. Then the question is, how much of a help has the IMF been to Ghana over the years? This is Fact Sheet, live on, happy, uh, live on ETV Ghana and also live on Nisim in Tamale, Nisim, in, in Bogotanga. We'll be right back. Many thanks for staying on with that. Sir. This is Fact Sheet live on ETV Ghana, live on Nisim in Bogotanga, Nisim in Tamale, and also live on Facebook. My final question to uh, my panel this evening will be <laughs> Doug, you're laughing already. <laughs> it's going to be funny. <laughs> 
so, so my question is, how much of an assistance has the IMF been to Ghana's economy over the years? Uh, in the short term, very much uh, stability. They will give you stability. They will be give you policy credibility, and then they will leave. And so all the time, it has always been short term, short term, short term. Mm. One year, two years, three years. The last time we went for them, we started, we started from 2015 mm. and it ended in 2018. Mm. And, and so when they come, like for right now, they, 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 this current one, we need them. Yeah. There's a need. And so if you want to quantify the help, mm -hmm. it's going to be very big. Because the help that they will give us is very big. We need it. But when they finish and they leave, the help becomes small. <laughs> so, so usually, my point has always been what you do with what they left you with. Mm -hmm. The stability, the calmness, the calmness in the atmosphere in the international market, the credibility they have given you, the fact that the investors are willing to work with you. Mm -hmm. If they leave, are you going to continue with the momentum of keeping inflation down, keeping mm. interest rate down, keeping you? Are you going to promote your export because the reserves that they'll help you build will no longer be coming from them? Mm -hmm. You have to generate it yourself. How do you do? You do, you do it through exports. Mm. So you should be building more exports to be able to develop your reserves, and then. The exports will show up the city, it will stabilize the city, it will not be depreciating that far because you have more dollars in the system. Mm. The inflation will not be getting out of hand because you are doing local production, your mm -hmm. food production is intact, mm -hmm. fertilizer is available, the storage facility is there, the transportation is good so that the farmers will not incur losses. And then you move on to the fiscal consolidation. Are you able to mobilize revenue yourself? Mm -hmm. How do you spend what you have mobilized? Mm. Since we finished the HIPIC initiative in 2006, the growth rate or the rate at which the public debt increases mm. is far higher. It outpaces the growth rate of domestic revenue. So in, other, in simple terms, since we completed the HIPIC initiative, governments upon governments that have come after 2006 have they concentrated more on borrowing than raising revenue. Mm. And so when the IMF comes, they will tell you to slow down with the borrowing and concentrate on mobilizing revenue domestically. And so when they come, I'm sure a lot will be on the fiscal consolidation, on the raising of revenue. And then being prudent, being prudent on the expenditure. They, they will identify one or two areas. Of course, they will go through the books. Mm -hmm. And every three months, you go, they will do a review. So it's not like three years and then for they the next three years. No, 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 no. Every, it, if it is review periodically, periodic review. So they, you, you, you set a target, maybe first one quarter target. You bring it, they will review it. You go, you come again, they review it, and you go. And I'm sure they will be giving the money in tranches, mm. like they did last time. Last time. So yeah. uh, until you complete it, you're not getting the money. So you can, and because we need the money, we will complete it. And we will be disciplined we'll be enough disciplined. to complete and it. And so the help that they are going to give us is just similar to the help that they gave us in the, in the previous 16 times. There was a need for it, and so the help was big time. But when they leave, what do we do with the help? That's a big question. Uh, yeah. Julius, a quick one. Some of the your question that is a benefit is that um, they are going to or help. otherwise yeah maybe they are just going to help us balance our trade payment also trying to restore some investor confidence into our economy which Doc has already highlighted that is policy credibility mm. one of the things that I have observed is that it has also become a political expediency for certain government because if they want to undertake any structural adjustment you know government has to be disciplined you impose the fiscal responsibility act that is not spending five percent of your gdp mm -hmm. they couldn't you know um, um observe it during COVID came years and then as at now our fiscal deficit is 9.5 percent so now what you know people are on government government is doing this government is doing that when they go to the imf they put that burden to imf that yes we brought in the big brother and then he's saying we should do a b and c 
Now we've also had um, the labor agitation that is teachers are also on strike. Next so, came out uh, exactly. Not, not so too long ago. All, all the burden that government is supposed to absorb, they are going to push it on IMF. So it makes IMF the easy target. Now that you go government will tell you, look, we are an IMF program, we don't have any money, we are now consolidating our fiscals. And because of that, <laughs> they take that pressure off the public and then they focus on what they want to do. So these are some of the things that governments are trying to do. But we hope, like um, Doc said, in the long in the short term, they're just going to give us some liquidity, mm. some access to cash. But it's not going to come for free. It is going to come with conditions. It is going to come with a cost. And we should brace ourselves for one more additional hardship in the economy. I mean... We should brace ourselves exactly. for additional hardships in What the is going to happen is that because if you are going to... Government is going to... IMF is going to stop government from borrowing. And if they do that, then it means that they have to find alternative source of generating revenue. Mm -hmm. If that is going to happen, the E-Levy doc has said he has written a lot of articles about it. Maybe they might tackle the implementation again. And when that happens, they are going to expand the scope of E-Levy mm. to be able to bring in that needed revenue. Because as it stands now, we know that uh, from the tweet that came from Gabi, that is doing about 10% currently. Yes. So there might be some form of imposition of tax, either trying to look at um, bringing in a new e-levy or trying to go back to the existing taxes and look at how they are going to increase compliance. And that, that, that's additional burden. Yes, that would be on, additional. On the, on the tax, on the, the tax pay. On the uh, tax pay. Property rich wouldn't be additional burden. Mm. But a lot of people are not paying. Uh, no, no, no. So, see, so they see, can enforce it. I mean, if you have a property, why wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to pay tax on that? You, you're, giving, you're giving them you an see, idea no, now. No, the yeah, thing I, is I that. Think that's, that's one of the areas yeah, that probably they they should, should, they On property rates. You know, I have evidence to it that people are really paying, especially with business institutions. Mm, mm. And it's a lot of money. Mm. We haven't seen the accountability part of property rate. Mm. The second point is rental income. Mm -hmm. Businesses are paying a lot of rental income. And then when payments are affected, then we deduct 15% withholding taxes and remit it to government. Mm -hmm. We don't see where those monies, monies are go. going. So when, when they are talking about, yes, they are going to harmonize, you know, a certain platform to collect property rate, I don't see the head and tail. The point is that it is the lack of the accountability of our taxes. Mm. Look, in 2021, you impose COVID-19 levy, sanitation and pollution levy, you impose 5% um, profit on bank to just, you know, the financial sector. These are taxes that came in. You, they, this is the time government must come to Ghanaians. An account. An account for, and for, tell for, us for. exactly. That is why the E-Levy is suffering. Now, Ghanaians are able to descend very well and then try to know how they are going to avoid the taxes when they are imposed. Quick, quick one to, to, to my guest on Zoom, um, Professor Gachi, if, if you're there, after the steroids, what next for, the Ghana, for Ghana's economy? I didn't get your question. I'm asking, after the bailout by the IMF, I, I call the bailout the steroids. After the steroids, what next for Ghana's economy? Well, we don't know whether we are going to get a bailout or not. Mm. They are now in the negotiation. So if the negotiation ends well on 13th of this month, then we may get a program to go with. Mm. Then we may be discussing that. Uh, but I think what is crucial, uh, that all stakeholders are coming on board, UTAC is coming on board with mm. their issue. Uh, I think we need to place on record that IMF will be interested in uh, what happened just after we exited the program. You recall that we put in place Fiscal Responsibility Act in 2018 uh, um, to ensure that our fiscal figure will be a maximum of 5%. Uh, if we go beyond 5% by additional 1%, then you may, call, you may be called by parliament for the for possibility of essential uh, process, mm. but the same government wrote to IMF that our deficit in 2019 was 7.5, which meant that within one year of putting in place a fiscal responsibility act, we violated it. Mm. So it is not during COVID that we suspended the, the fiscal responsibility law as enshrined in uh, our public financial management law okay. and the fiscal responsibility law. Okay. So all those things will give a trigger to IMF to trace our problems before COVID and during COVID and whatever we have 
uh, today. And uh, I don't see the process as uh, it could be fast, mm. but the outcome of the process may paint a different picture about uh, the government of Ghana. Okay. The government of Ghana is looking for uh, balance of payment support, but <laughs> all that we're talking about is not balance of payment support per se. It is about the fiscal disruption through the kind of management that we have seen. Mm. Uh, so that that will be the focus of this uh, discussion. Okay. We may be tilting towards uh, restructuring our debt because that is critical. So uh, I, I think we should put that in perspective. All right. Uh, IMF has been of great benefit to us in the past. In fact, I did not mean IMF. Some political parties will not be talking about social intervention groups because during the HIPIC, it was a demand mm. that you provide a, a program, like my colleague was saying, that periodically you program a program that you do to deal with the, 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 the poverty aspect of the HIPIC. Prof, I, 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 kindly, kindly forgive me. I, I mean, time is fast spent and we may have to actually uh, wrap up here. Thank you very much for joining us. And I believe that we may Next have Next time you organize a program to, like this, uh, well. To get this particular matter. <laughs> Professor John Gachi is the dean of the Business School of University of Cape Coast. And also Dr. Adu Ususa Kodye is an economist and a lecturer at the University of Ghana. And uh, Mr. Julius Jima is a financial uh, analyst and also a tax expert. And also... Uh, Mr. Kofi Kranting, join us via Zoom. Thank you uh, for joining us and uh, have a good night. The show will be repeated tomorrow at 10 a.m. live on ETV. I am Sifa Dankwa.